Welcome everyone uh, to the Environmental Film Festival in the nation's capital. We are extremely blessed uh, to bring you some uh, phenomenal leaders who have just been doing incredible work in so many different spaces uh, for decades now and bringing along young people uh, and new voices to also make sure that we're building the base and that we are achieving real transformational goals. Uh, I I'm blessed that that I know two of the three very, very well uh, and know their work. And uh, I'm also learning more about one of the individuals who's with us today, who has also just been doing some amazing work uh, all across the planet. Um, so let me just real quickly uh, introduce to you, if you're not familiar with uh, these transformational figures, uh, their names. Uh, the first one uh, is my sister, Melanie Campbell. Uh, the other is my brother, Reverend Lennox Yearwood, and then my new brother, Simon Eridazoni. Uh, and Simon, you'll have to make sure that I say your last name right. Trust me, people mess my first name up all the time. So um, if I do, um, uh, blame it to uh, my eyes and not my heart, as they say. Um, we're going to have some really interesting conversations today. We understand that we are in a moment, a transformational moment, that gives us an opportunity to make sure that we are honoring uh, the civic process, making sure that we understand that it is connected to everything that goes on inside of our lives, both in a positive way. And when we don't have uh, that opportunity, we don't have that access, that it also can have some real negative uh, impacts uh, inside of communities uh, in our country and, and of course the ripples across the planet. Um, with that being said, I wanna just dive in. Uh, and Melanie, I'm gonna come to you first because uh, ladies first, and it is Women's History Month. Um, so can you share with folks, uh, with the viewers, a little about your organization and why it was created? Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Did I get that right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, thank you so much um, for all you do in this space. And of course, my brother, Reverend Yearwood, um, I get in the foxhole, Simon, with any of these guys. And I'm sure since you're on this list, I see your, your role that I'd get in the foxhole with you too, because we're in, a, we're in this time and uh, my organization has been around 46 years and I've not been here that long, but uh, I've been here quite a while. Um, National Coalition on Black Civic Participation. Uh, we focus on civil rights, voter empowerment, power building, um, voting rights. Uh, wear another hat. I'm president and CEO of this organization, but also um, we have a women and girls empowerment and power building arm called Black Women's Roundtable, where we do a lot of our pop also do a lot of policy and empowerment work focused on Black women and girls. Um, and we focus on health and wellness, economic security and prosperity, education, global empowerment. Uh, one of our issues, which is why I've always loved to be uh, here with you all as far as one of those issues that impacts us is the issue of the environment, issues of climate change. And I look to these groups to, to guide us over the years to see how we can weigh in and be helpful in moving the ball. Um, and I think we're at a moment where, even though there's a lot of pushback in ways, we're in a better place than we were a year and a half ago, I would say. Um, and uh, so that's, in sh that's a short, short version. Thank you for that. Uh, Rev, uh, uh, let's dive in. Uh, I know there is an interesting history with the Hip Hop Caucus. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how it came to be um, and, and, you know, what's going on right now in this space? Yeah, no, thank you, Mustafa. It's always, you know, just an honor to see you, you know. Uh, you are part of the Hip Hop Caucus and always will be. So it's, it's always good. Actually, I think so is Melanie. Everybody, I think, is hip hop to the core. Um, let me also just shout out again what you just said about Melanie. I, I love Melanie Campbell. She's been a blessing to our movement. And we 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 owe her such a debt of gratitude. Um, you know, I was mentored by Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, and it was met, wasn't too many brothers who was who was mentored by her, but I remember being in that space and obviously seeing Melanie and just the open arms. And I think Hip Hop Caucus was created with that in mind how we could use one's cultural expression to shape one's political experience and using hip hop as a culture to create change. And we're still doing that in many areas uh, in regards to 
democracy in regards to climate, civil and human rights. Um, and I think one of the key things around which is exciting about this process is that we're really looking at how we can use narrative organizing and storytelling and producing content to tell our story better. So I think that's one of the things Hip Hop Caucus is doing right now. And I'm just excited to have this conversation. Well, Simon, I think Rev brought us right to you. Um, I know your history as an editor and as a director um, and, and the power uh, that you've been able uh, to utilize um, in, in that space. C could you share a little bit with us? Sure. Well, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I feel very humbled to be amongst um, all of you. Um, and it's a great honor to be uh, talking to you guys. Um, my journey really started way back in 2003 um, when we discovered and came across uh, an activist, a grandmother in Seattle who downloaded the secret software that counted at the time around 40% of America's votes. Um, and she was just amazing the work that she was doing. It was real grassroots self-started activism. And so we followed her as storytellers and as filmmakers. And that has brought us through three films. Um, the most recent was Kill Chain, um, The Cyber War on America's Democracy, uh, which was nominated for an Emmy um, last year. Um, and I, I, I hope that we have created some light um, in an area of election integrity, which has seen a lot of heat um, from both sides of the political divide. Um, we've made these films because we fundamentally believe that in order to have a strong and viable and just civic society that you need to have proper elections. And I mean, it, it sounds so obvious, doesn't it? <laughs> you would think that that doesn't need to be said, um, but unfortunately it does need to be said. Um, and so that's what we've spent a lot of our time doing. Thank you for that. Uh, Melanie, if I could come back to you, you know, for decades, black and brown communities um, have been doing everything that they can uh, to one, get access to the vote, two, to then be able to protect the vote. And of course, we have other allies and brothers uh, and sisters uh, who are also, you know, doing what they can in that. We are now in a very uh, hyper uh, partisan moment, if you will. How do how does your organization or how do we as a movement, maybe that's the better question, how do we really get engaged um, in this moment that we find ourselves in to protect both access uh, and, and folks being able to utilize the fullness of the civic process? Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Tell people to definitely stay involved. We're in the middle of this midterm election, and we know we say this all the time, Rev. This is the most important election of our lifetime. It's the most, um, most important election of our lifetime and uh, democracy. We said it in 2020, it was on the ballot, but it's, it's on life support. Um, and if, because we have not been able to get uh, voting rights legislation passed in the current Congress at this point, we're in the middle of an election where we're seeing in real time the voter suppression laws that are being enacted um, in states after the historic uh, uh, voter turnout of black and brown and young people in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic, right? We had to risk our lives uh, that the backlash to that and the first black South Asian woman elected just like we had a backlash in 2008 when President Obama was the first African-American black man to be elected. We had a backlash that started in 2010 and we were coming out from under that a bit. Uh, and then 2016 hit and we had the person who was elected who did, does not believe in democracy, but only believes in autocracy. And, and as long as he's running it and that's not partisan, just facts. Uh, we got a lot of receipts to prove that even now. So here we are in 2020, well, 2022, where we've had a backlash last year of all these state elections. And for black people in this country, we've always had to have our voting rights protected uh, um, from, from, from way back, for a whole time that we've had the franchise. We've never had the freedom to vote. We've only had, Cor Mrs. Cora Massesberry said it, political scientist and former first lady. 
they loan us the vote because we've always had to fight to get it. We've always had to fight to keep it. And we're at that point yet again. But this time, they put it on a different plane. The new way of Jim Crow, people say 2.0, I'm going to say 3.0, it's so bad, is that they want, they're changing laws in states like Florida and Texas and Georgia and other places. I'm sorry, Georgia and Texas, Florida did a crazy one too, but not exactly the same, where they can control who counts the votes. They can override local boards of elections. You know, I'm a, I'm a native Florida. Y'all know I'm from Mims, Florida, Harry and Harry T. Moore country, where they bombed them for NACP leaders for uh, having the audacity to register black voters. So I come out of the South um, and I come out of that kind of climate that is, is resurging, not in the exact same way yet, right? But in a way that it, it is about changing the actual structure of this country to where it's okay. People think they want autocracy. They think they want it. But look at what's happening in Ukraine, right? Look what Russia's doing. There's a connecting point because that same president was, was, was uh, it loved folks like Putin. It, all of this stuff is related because there's a global attack on democracy. And we think that the exceptionalism of, of, our, of our nation, the United States of America, is an exception to what's going on globally, but it's not. So what's happening in 2022 is that if, we're, if we end up with, we can vote, we can organize wherever like we always do, most often like we always do, and mobilize our people, and we're gonna go against the grain, and we're gonna make it happen. But then some folks can come in and say, we don't like what happened in Fulton County. So we're gonna come and take over. And when y'all get to counting them close elections, we, we might just change those about votes. So we're in this moment where we're fighting against the wind. And some of that's from my friends, you know, and it, I don't know if I can say, it's okay, we can say who the friends are. Okay, <laughs> just wanna make sure I don't get about in trouble. You know, Senator Manchin is Senator the cinema. Supposed to be friends, uh, playing with the other folks. And you have a whole party that has acquiesced any semblance of decency, in my opinion, to just turn over this democracy so that one party will rule, a certain type of white male will rule. If you're a white male who believes in inclusion, you on the wrong side of history, or in some cases, a white female, mostly. This is mostly that, and I'm not being, right? Because we're in that, I, 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 you know, I normally am a little bit more harsh with my words, Simon, but we got to set the alarm about what's going on in our country, or we won't even have one. My 10-year-old great nephew who lives with me with his father won't have it. My nine-year-old um, niece, Journey, won't have half of the opportunity we have if where we're going in this country ends up becoming a reality. And that is, a, we won't have a democracy. You know something, Rev? Uh, Melanie's words remind me of James Baldwin when he once said that if I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. I know the Hip Hop Caucus often works with communities who have often not been seen and not been heard, whether it is young people, returning citizens, a number of others. Can you talk a little bit about, in this moment, why the work with those communities and others that Melanie just mentioned are, are so incredibly important? Well, well most definitely. Well, I think that those communities is where the solution actually lies. I think that is in those communities where we'll find the genius that can get us to the next level. It is in those communities who have suffered the most from everything from the climate crisis, not having clean air and clean water, to gun violence, to issues of women's rights, queer rights, and many other issues that have affected those communities. And so they understand what it means to be as you have said so often, to be considered sacrifice zones and to be communities that have been tossed to the side. And so we, they understand the connection of why and how democracy is critical. They know that either you shape policy or policy will certainly shape them. And they've seen it. They've seen it through the highways that have been built to their community. They've seen it 
from the aspect of the policy that have allowed them to be polluted. So I think that that's why their voice is, mo is so critical, why we have a caucus go to them, the frontline and frontline communities to be the solution um, in this issue of democracy. But I think that what Melanie is saying is very important because she mentioned that there are folks who are literally in positions of power who are not doing the work of the people, but doing work of the polluters. And I think that what we're seeing now is that democracy is being challenged because the reality is that we have communities, as you know, Mustafa and Melanie and Simon, we have communities who are suffering, who are literally dying at the hands of corporations and industries. And they, because of their greed, because their business plan means a destinance for these communities, they are literally willing to strip away democracy take away their right to make decisions, take away their right to vote and create the road barriers and roadblocks to stopping them. That's this moment. And so this isn't a moment just about democracy. It's a moment about life and death. And so we have to do everything we can to educate our communities. But I also want to say this. A lot of times, folks who do get in positions of power who are elected aren't doing that work for those same communities. And then folks become frustrated because they say, hey, we put somebody in position to go to the state house, to go to Washington, so to speak. And they're not fighting for us. They're fighting for the same folks that are, that are hurting us. And so we do need to have a, a, a system that allows for accountability and measurability to say what is going on. But I think this is, as, as Melanie said quite well, this really is our moment to stand up to ensure that we have, that we can literally take democracy off life support. Mm, I like that, take it off life support, okay. Simon, let me, let me come to you. W.E. Du Bois once said that a system cannot fail those it was never meant to protect. Uh, in, in your films, you often dive deep into the ways that folks are trying to suppress the vote, ways that folks are trying to manipulate the vote. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, some of these tools and techniques that individuals are, are, are currently using uh, to try and gain the system, if you will? Sure. So <clears throat> I think democracy, if it's anything, it is knowing what the will of the people is. And I think that one of the most disturbing aspects of um, America's system, and as many will realize, um, I'm not American, I'm, I'm, I'm English, I'm from the United Kingdom. Um, and it, it's also in, 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 in our society as well. But what, one of the big problems is that the system in America doesn't produce enough evidence for people to say, yes, that's absolutely right or wrong. There is too much doubt in the system. You have computers, black boxes, that you can't audit, you can't go into them and actually prove what happened inside that computer. And it's very bizarre because if you think about um, other really important public uh, kind of, um, how can one put it, public explanations of fact, if you will. So finances, you have audits. For justice, you have an open court and a verdict, you know, where all the evidence is drawn up. And, and all of these are designed to create confidence. And for me, the most disturbing thing is that there is so much unconfidence in the system at the moment. It allows doubt. It allows that awful lack of hope um, because people feel that they have no possibility of their will being expressed through the ballot box. I think sometimes we call that apathy. I think that's the wrong word for it. It's not people not being bothered to go and vote. It's because they feel profoundly disempowered by the political system that they're in. Um, and that very often they don't want to validate it by, by turning up for something that they feel will ultimately betray them. Um, and so in, in a way, um, you know, we've heard uh, from Melanie and from, from Rev, 
you know, you, you, you need these big ideas, these great ideas about politics and representation and all that, that's, that's all really important. But you know, the other thing that you need is really, really solid administration. And that sounds so boring, um, but you, you, you need that sense that it's gonna be solid, that when you hand your ballot in, it's gonna be looked after and it will be counted as cast. Um, and I think that's really one of the main things that's lacking in America at the moment. And that's a problem that we found over and over again, that an activist will say, hey, I'm, I'm not really sure I, I, you know, something is funny about this result. They go digging and then suddenly they find that all the evidence has been shredded or they find that they spend years trying to gain access to public records that they should just be able to get. Um, or that they're lied to, or any number of different things. So um, that's been our experience of uh, seeing the workings of, of democracy, and, it, and it's not pretty. And you know, if I had a big hope for America's democracy, it would be that it can serve not just the political process, but its actual people, and that it can give them a sense that they matter, that they have dignity, and that the system is there to serve them and not the other way around. Sounds like those foundational words around we the people uh, find these truths to be self-evident. <laughs> <laughs> that all, all men and women are created equal. Uh, but we'll leave that alone, uh, unless everybody else uh, decides to do something with that. I, I wanna go to, uh, Melanie, I wanna come to you and, and talk a little bit about authentic allyship. Because there's a whole lot of folks uh, who often will rush into the space um, and say that they are allies, but, I, but I'm curious, what does authentic allyship uh, need to look like or should look like? Because I know you have been uh, working with all kinds of folks uh, over the years and, and, and some have lived up and, and some have fallen a little short. Uh, so I'm gonna, let you, I'm gonna let you do with that what you do. You tried to get me in trouble. Is he trying to get me in trouble, Mustafa? <laughs> no, ma'am. <laughs> authentic allyship well I've been you know my hashtag is and my Twitter handle is coalition builder right? mm -hmm. what I've I think I've learned because I'm always learning is that you have you have level of levels of authentic allyship mm -hmm. and sometimes you have seasonal allyship um, and sometimes you have allies that just aren't so when I say seasonal allyship I'm really talking about being able to and not to use this cliche you know about your permanent friends permanent friends, which is really important but I've learned to accept people for who they are and work through those who are authentically always, you can take it to the bank, you can get in the foxhole and they don't put sand over you. And then there's those that you make sure they go in first and you go in last so you can get out. <laughs> yeah. And then I've learned to to, to find out that there are those who are only there for oneself. And Dr. Height taught us, because she was taught by Mary McLeod Bethune and others. And I was taught by the Reverend James Oranges of the world and so many others that I was blessed to be mentored by over the years, right? Is that it does matter to work together. It does matter you can pull together much more with a fist held together and unity does matter, unity without uniformity, but also to have a forgiving spirit, because I don't get it right all the time. You don't get it right all the time. And I'm not, per one of the things about our quote unquote progressive space is that we don't know how to forgive one person over here, because I'm the purest of them all. And none of us are that. So what I've tried to do is just build the kind of coalitions and don't try to pick big eyes and little U's. Everybody come through the table. Now I used to be where I would, you know, really get upset and 
do all things. And I just, whoever I've learned, authentic allyship is also whoever shows up and rolls up their sleeves. That's my ally. If you show up and you just listen to the call to see what you can find out, I don't, I stop worrying about that. And I'll push back when I need to. Those who know me long enough know I can do that. But for the most part, I'm just trying to have some joy in the dash to do what I can do to help move the ball and let the rest of it fall where it may. No, I appreciate that. And for those who are watching, we only give real talk here. Uh, so we're just telling it like it is. Uh, Rev, you and I, we have traveled a lot of miles together. Mm -hmm. And I was blessed to watch how, one, you could hold people accountable, but at the same time, uh, continue to love them. Um, and there was a line that you often would start with parts of your stanzas when you would talk about folks on Monday and then you would translate uh, to folks on Tuesday or Wednesday. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna pass the mic to you so you can talk a little bit about uh, allyship. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the two parts that, that that stanza is in regards to climate leadership. And so, you know, you can't be a climate leader if you're talking about, you know, renewables on Monday and you're talking about, you know, uh, pipelines on Wednesday. That's <laughs> how those two things don't, don't work. But I kind of, you know, I want to talk about allyship, but I want to piggyback what Melanie said. That's very important because I need folks to understand that nobody loves America like black people. Um, and Mustafa, it, it baffles me, to be honest, that people of color, particularly black people, have fought in every single war. They have supported this country. They believe in democracy, even though they were brought here as enslaved people. And the only thing they want is their voice to matter. And it breaks my heart. I listened to Melanie, and I remember this past election, seeing particularly Black women in Georgia, but throughout this country, drag their babies, their husbands, their children to the polls. And the response to that wasn't that these were great Americans, which they are. It was that, let's take away the water. Let's take away making sure no food can come even though they were reduced to a situation where the polling places in their neighborhoods only had one working booth and they waited uh, even with the, the, the possibility of losing their job because they were waiting in line for four, six, in some cases, eight hours, waiting and standing. I saw pictures of them dancing, putting music up to keep themselves entertained. And I would say, these people love America and they love democracy. They're willing to do all this even when America doesn't show it loves them. And so the question here really is, I, is twofold. One, where do we go from here? In the words of Dr. King, community or chaos? Where do we go from here, Mustafa, when we're dealing with a situation where the more that particularly Black people love this country, the more that they are assaulted, and even killed. You and I both know that these same companies who are then putting pollution into these black women communities, causing them to have breast cancer, causing them to have emphysema, causing their children to have asthma. All these things go on despite, and that's the link between democracy. And then on top of that, when these folks do, to the point of allyship, when they show how impassioned they are to take their own money their own resources, their, their own networks, and they ask for a little bit to help support us, then the same groups who say they are on the same page, on the same team, give them lip service and don't give them the resources, make them go to the back of the line. I don't understand, really, how, to be honest, Black people stay sane in this country. And so I think that just shows the miraculous faith the miraculous determination and just the fortitude to overcome. 
And I think that that's where we are. That's why people keep trying to push it down. So when allies see that, they confuse that determination, that resiliency, with they gonna be okay. Not knowing that that's not okay as allies when you're not supporting. So let me say this to be clear. And there's a connection between democracy and climate. And there are folks who've been working on democracy, particularly in the civil rights community forever. And if, if groups are not supporting those groups to do this work, then something is wrong. The, the talk is over. It is time for action. Hmm. All right, let the church say amen. Uh, Simon, hmm. you um, are someone who, um, yes, lives in England, but also has done a lot of work here in the States. What is allyship? look like to you as someone who's connected, but yet can also step back from the country? Yeah, thank you, Mustafa. Um, it's a very, very interesting question because we filmed, I, I totted it up, I think it's like 18 states over the, um, you know, over the 15 years of filming that we've been doing. Um, and in all of that, I found, the most remarkable allies, um, extraordinary acts of generosity uh, from Americans it, at all stations, and also across all the you know the various colours of the political divide as well. Um, and but to come back to the Rev's uh, point, we have found a particular welcome. Uh, from the communities of color, because I think they know the game. Uh, they are um, less invested in the idea that America must be right and must be perfect, because they know that it's not. Uh, they're, they're more willing to confront some of the darker sides. Um, specific people I'd like to mention, I'd like to put a shout out to, um, one, we were very uh, honored and it was a, a great tragedy that she died, Stephanie Tubbs Jones. Um, we interviewed her because she challenged the results in the 2004 elections um, and was absolutely crucified for that. Um, and we, yes, she was, she was wonderful. Um, Another person who comes to mind is Cynthia McKinney of Georgia, um, who invited us very generously and graciously into her campaign uh, because she stood largely on a ticket of election integrity um, and she did not trust the voting machines. Um, but we've also found, uh, you know, a home with a lot of the technologists of America, you know, the kind of the, the nerds, um, a lot of the just people are at the very, very, you know, really right down on the on the bottom of the rungs, the real grassroots who do it and, you know, who sacrifice their lives and very often experience significant uh, financial hardship because of their activism. And all of these groups across America have welcomed us. And I hope um, that we have stepped up to that and, 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 and told their stories with as much love and as grace um, and, and truthfulness as, as, as we can. Um, in, terms of, in terms of climate, um, I did want to say that there is a unique opportunity in America through democracy um, to, for people to uh, put ballot initiatives forward and funnily enough that, you know, when we think of democracy, we think of presidential races and congressional races, but, but so much of what goes on in American democracy is at the very local level. Um, and I came across a figure that I think just, just short of two and a half billion dollars uh, were raised and taxed through ballot initiatives uh, to advance kind of climate friendly, um, either through decarbonization or reducing pollution or whatever. Um, across seven states, I mean, Michigan, Colorado, Texas, and, and, and a couple of others. Um, so I think that it, it's not just that democracy is a kind of a, you know, kind of a great idea. And, and obviously we need to make sure that everyone is represented because the, the poor and the marginalized in particular 
tend to suffer much more from um, climate disasters. Um, and all that's really important, but it's also important to, to acknowledge that there is hope because democracy in America through ballots initiatives gives people agency. You know, they can put, they can put it on the ballot, they can get it voted for. Most definitely, thank you. Rev, I want to come back to you uh, and then Melanie, I'm, and then I'm, I'm going to have a follow up with you. Rev, you talked a little bit about some of the voter suppression things that are currently going on, you know, uh, whether it is the movement of ballot box, drop boxes, you know, moving polling stations, um, and then some of the things that's just so hard to understand, as you said, folks can't give people a bottle of water or some food. The IPCC report just came out uh, talking about, you know, how much a more impactful the climate crisis is going to be. Temperatures, uh, you know, increasing at a significant rate. Um, the, these uh, extreme rain events, uh, all these different types of dynamics that are part of that. I want to bring that into our voting uh, sort mm -hmm. of paradigm that we're talking about. How much more difficult does it become for, as you said, someone standing in line six, eight, 10 hours who's a senior or someone who has uh, other medical challenges with these types of dynamics that are being overlaid or anchored actually by voter suppression? I mean, I think there's a direct correlation. Obviously there are those. So let me do something that's very important. To do voter suppression to someone you have to not see them as an American citizen or even human because you wouldn't do that to your neighbor. And so if you're making your neighbor's process much more difficult, voting, particularly, I mean, just making senior citizens, you know, wait in line or have to then go to the, the DMV to get an ID, which they probably can't get, to them have them to vote, to just make the process harder. They, you can't give a senior, you must senior citizens or whoever, someone water in line who's been in line um, for quite some time. You are doing that because you don't see that person to frankly as human less than a and, and an American citizen. The correlation which you're saying there with the climate crisis is this. The reason why 68% of black people are within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant, because those who put that, that, that coal-fired power plant in their community didn't see those people in that community as human. Hence, they wouldn't put that in their own community. And so there's a direct coalition, correlation between the fact that voter suppression and sacrifice zones and further the policies that are put forth, as we know now from either Build Back Better Act or Justice 40 or a number of EJ, remember to justice policies that are being held up because policymakers aren't pushing that forward. So I think that there's a connection here because you don't see the people as literally citizens. But let me go further, Mr. the IPCC report for folks who are listening. Right now, there is a connection between St. Petersburg in Russia and St. James Parish in Cancer Alley. And I don't think people understand that that connection for oil and gas and coal, and now the war for that, that is raging in the Ukraine, and now originally throughout the world, we're dealing with droughts and wildfires and hurricanes and floods. Those same things are also going to impact those same people who are standing in line. And many times, particularly after a natural disaster or after a hurricane, they are literally the same ones who are most impacted are the ones who are literally being disenfranchised. So. We have folks like the amazing and great Melanie Campbell and many others who literally have connected the dots. And they're saying simply this, that we realize that you have never seen us as human. You have seen us as three fifths. You have given us the poll tax. You've made us count marbles, bubbles in the soap. 
you have never seen us as human, but to be damned what you think. We are here and our voice matters and we're going to fight no matter what happens because we are done dying at the hands of your injustice. There it is. Uh, Melanie, let me pass the mic to you. Hmm. I had so many emotions just listening to y'all. <laughs> to be honest, trying to keep my composure because it can, it can, it's, it's a lot. And our people are really dealing with a lot. And um, so, you know, as I was, we start talking about Cancer Alley, I, I, the first person who brought me to pay attention to understanding environmental injustice was Damu Smith, mm -hmm. who had me on, on a bus. Uh, we went through Cancer Alley and went through New Orleans and things, you know, and where people's public housing was sitting on top of landfills. And so, so you, I just had a flashback, you know, and then knowing you and you, Mustafa, and my sister Felicia, and all of you all, Jacqueline, you know, who, who really, um, because my first time I heard about climate change was uh, the year of the um, World Conference Against Racism, 2001. Yeah, because that was also 9 11. We just got back and then 9 11 hit. But being able to start connecting that, like what they got to do with voting, right? I was I was green. I, 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 I don't mean that in the literal sense of green, right? but I was really naive uh, back then. And it took activists to, for me to understand what was happening. And many people don't know. And so I think the, the ecosystem that has brought black voices into this, um, into this uh, whole issue around environment and justice and climate change and how that connects back to what's happening in our communities and what's happening to our health and what's happening to but we can't build wealth, right? Our homes won't ever have parity, all these things. But then at the same time, finding a way for our people to feel that we still have some power to do something about it. And we have to stay uh, vigilant and know that um, we won't win all the all the battles, but if we stay with it, we we, we are resilient people. But we, but the, but this is stretching us, it's stretching us, you know, behind COVID and all these things. So we're in this moment, and at the same time, we're we, we're like you say, damn if you're gonna push us back, right? We're gonna keep fighting, but we also, you know, we got one hand here, and we're pushing like this, and we gotta find a way to grab a hold and push back with both of our hands is where we are in this moment because the idea of what you're talking about, Rev, when you're talking about the fact that they are putting these laws in place, yes, they see us, they don't see us as their equal, um, but more importantly, the, 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 the demographics are shifting and have been shifting, right? And, and so there's this idea that some, and this is, I don't know this because I'm not sitting in the living rooms of those who don't believe in inclusion. I'm not sitting in those living rooms, right? So, but if I was, and if I could imagine what they're talking about, right, is that they think we're going to take something or we're going to come do what you, what you did to our ancestors. And all we're trying to do is live and take care of our families and take care of our communities and have, and so that my taxes come back to my community. I don't know, most black people are sitting around thinking about what it's going to do to you if, if, if we become the president of the United States, because we've done that already, right? So at the end of the day, what, you, what, you, what, you, what, you, what are you frightened about? I'm going to stop because I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to stop. Gonna stop. Right. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's really at this point, and, it's, we're, and I said it earlier, we're at an inflection point. But we're gonna push, and we and we're gonna own what power we have, and that that's why I say that collective power is the best weapon we have because they can divide us, they can't conquer, you know. And it's and I say the who the they those who don't believe that all of us have a have a have a God given right to opportunity, all of us have a God given right, and 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 that and then because I'm trying to make sure that my community and the people that I love 
have an opportunity does not mean I'm spending my time trying to figure out what I'm going to take away from you to the point that you will do everything in your power to disempower us, to kill us, to act like you don't understand when all it takes is just to step back and say, if what I do, then you said it, would I do that to my brother? Would I do that to my sister? Right? Mm -hmm. No doubt. My mother and my grandmother always says you have power unless you give it away. And we're going to continue to utilize that power in a positive way when the change happens. Uh, we only have a short amount of time left, and I, and I got a few more things I want to dive into. So, Simon, I'm going to come to you, and Rev, then I'm going to come to you right afterwards with, uh, with the same question. Uh, Simon, what role do creatives play in helping us to address voter suppression and voter education, uh, environmental injustice, and the climate crisis? Yeah. When we started on Hacking Democracy way, way back, um, we were absolutely marginal voices. And the people who agreed with us were also marginal voices when we said America's votes can be hacked. Mm -hmm. We followed all of these different characters. And in particular, we followed uh, our main activist who then co-opted some computer scientists and in particular a Finnish hacker who was able to demonstrate that you could flip a vote on a voting machine not not by ballot stuffing or anything like that but just by rewriting the code without leaving a trace of the crime mm -hmm. and so a voting machine would take the ballots in it would scan them and the votes would be flipped in doing that, we transformed the terms of the debate around election integrity. Up until that point, if you said that the voting machines could be hacked or that the results could be swapped or anything like that, you would simply be kicked out of the debate as a conspiracy theorist. After our film, it had to be accepted as a fact. And, and I think that that is what creatives can do. They transform narratives. They are able to see um, different frames of reference. They are able to give things new names. They are able to bring marginal voices in uh, and, to, and, 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 and to make all that sing. You know, because it's got to be entertaining. It's got to be enjoyable to watch. No one's going to, you know, no one's going to go watch a boring film. So that's our power. That is our that is our superpower. It's that transformation in the in the public sphere and the, and the, and the public debate. Without a doubt, uh, Rev. Let me let me pass the mic to you. Yeah. Well, first, let me just give a shout out to this film festival um, for when we actually put forth one of our first films. Uh, Ancient Mother's Heat Wave. Uh, it played at this film festival last year. It was one of the first climate comedy documentaries um, that showcased what is going on, not only in the Hampton Roads, Norfolk area, but literally how comedy can have an impact to telling the story. Um, I think, you know, Mustafa, that's a very important question because we know, because the climate movement itself doesn't really understand the impact of storytelling as it should. And I think that because they have used data and litigation and research and even grassroots advocacy, storytelling has been kind of on the back end of that process. And even when they've told stories, it's been kind of told stories to kind of preach to the choir, in essence, um, to kind of like tell the story that people who are in the kind of movement already know in some aspects. And so I think there's a need to have new stories and new storytelling that can help with narrative organizing, help with the actual grassroots advocacy. Now, there's a difference between the story and storytelling. Um, one of the folks that I'm working with now is Dream Hampton. And Dream Hampton did Surviving R. Kelly. And in that, the story was R. Kelly and the horrific acts that he did with the victims. But the storyteller was Dream Hampton and the folks. So there's a need to organize and mobilize and energize storytellers to bring forth, like Simon, in essence, to bring forth 
these stories that gotta be told. There's also an impact to have folks like you, Mustafa, many folks who are out there doing this work to actually have your story and the community data and things you know be brought to light, either through animation or through other stories in that aspect. And so there's a lot of work we need to do in that aspect. And I think as storytellers, we're at the cusp of a new way because we have to, because we're losing the battle of broadening the movement. So we need stories to do that. The other thing I think is important here in regards to storytelling around these conversations, this also goes to democracy as well, is that we need stories to be intertwined through what we would call the Hollywood experience. So if it's like Blackish or if it's like whatever other story, that we need sort of democracy or climate to be intertwined in those stories. Um, if it's uh, you name whatever story you whatever show you like, we need the story to be put into that storyline, and so we need it to be part of that process as well. Not just a documentary or a or or you know a movie on Netflix, but we need to be intertwined. So people can see it as a part of the process. I think this is critical right now because people aren't understanding all the aspects of the story, Mustafa. And we have a tendency to make this story very scientific or data-driven um, and very hard to understand. So even allies who are like maybe in Melanie's world, who would want to be a part of this, she came through and I'm sure that's with Donald Smith uh, in this process, but even allies who are in democracy or in the movement for Black lives or in immigration or in the prison reform movement, the more that we can tell these stories to intertwine that, it's, it'd be very powerful. For example, when the wildfires were going on in California, the, it was the prisoners who were in prison who were made firefighters who didn't get paid any money to put out those wildfires. And so, and then they were allowed to become firefighters after they got out of prison. So those are the kind of stories there that show the injustice, but need to be told. Um, and so I, I'll stop there, but I think that Hip Hop Caucus is doing some amazing things to become not only just a storyteller, but also a production house for Black, Brown, and Indigenous storytellers. Most definitely. I'm going to ask you all um, to be able to answer the next couple of things in 30 seconds, which I know is not always easy, uh, but we're just a tiny bit short on time. So, Simon, I'll come to you first. Uh, if you could talk with any historic figure uh, who has been in the area that, that you focus on or another area, what would it be and what would be that question that you would ask them? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You just dropped out there. Let's yeah, start. if you could talk with any historic figure who has been in your area of focus, who would it be? And what would be the question you would ask them? Oh, that's a question. Yes. Ah, time machine. God, oh, blimey, who would I talk to? Um, I would talk to, I would talk to Abraham Lincoln. I would talk to Abraham Lincoln because he just risked it all. Um, and, yeah, I, if I think American democracy, I, I think Abraham Lincoln. I, that, that's, that's all I can say, Mustafa. It's, okay. it's maybe not a very imaginative answer, but that's what comes to mind. No, that, that, that's fine. Uh, Rev? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a hard one. I think my, if I could talk to anybody, I might, I probably would have said Jesus. <laughs> I got a lot to talk about with Jesus. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> got a lot to talk about. Oh, I need to have a talk with Jesus. But I say this, and that might be way off the top. Let me just say that I would probably talk to Paul Robeson um, just to really just dig into all that he did and glean from him um, in that process. Melanie. Actually, I would like to talk to someone who I already knew who's gone on. I'd love to have Dr. Height here one more time, right? As we struggle through some of the things that we've struggled through, I think of a lot of other people, but her presence just would calm the waters. Dr. Height called you, but there are times when I'm like, wow, what it was like when I moved here in DC in the 90s 
and some of the challenges that I, when we talked about allyship question was, you know, in some ways I had to just say, okay, I can't fix that problem. Um, but I also remember it's never been a perfect movement, but I, I do believe that there was more, um, in some ways, more unity. Um, and you would, there were things that, that people would have, you know, Black family reunion and things like that, that really brought us to how to get some of that community feel back to some, it's so individualistic, how to figure that out. Um, so I, I would say, uh, Dr. Hype, and maybe my dad, you know, <laughs> too, because he was an activist. And, and I'd like to talk to him about what his little baby daughter, because he left when I was 18 in 79, so a long time ago. Thank you for that. Uh, Simon, coming to you uh, in the last 30 seconds. Uh, what does the world look like when your work is successful? It's, it's more free. It's more free. It's more just. Um, and people have agency and control over their lives. And they're able to do the work that's needed for their loved ones. Thank you. Rev, what does the world look like when your work is successful? It simply means that someone's life has been extended. When they might have died when they were 40, they live to see 60 or 70. Mm -hmm. Melanie, what does the world look like when your work is successful? When folks have more joyous days than, than sad days and, 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 and can enjoy the fruits of their labor and have a chance to breathe in and out and quickly January 5th versus January 6th. Mm -hmm. So the people who worked and did all of that work in Georgia, they went to bed one way and had to wake up another way. The world did, the nation did with the insurrection, but they didn't get a chance to breathe and enjoy the moment uh, of what they did. And so just be able to have more time to breathe in and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Well, I, I wanna thank uh, the DC Environmental Film Festival. I, I wanna thank Simon. I wanna thank Melanie and I wanna thank Rev uh, for your commitment uh, and for the, everything that you do each and every day to lift up so many different folks. Um, there are never gonna be enough words to, to thank you for all uh, that you've given. And uh, I also just wanna leave everybody with the words of my grandmother, that when you know better, do better. Yeah. This is a part of education, so now let's go out and do better. So thank each and every one of you. And thank you, Mustafa, for all you do and your power behind not just your words, but your deeds. I appreciate that and I receive it. Thank you so much. We will see everyone soon uh, and hopefully everyone will also continue to enjoy uh, and continue to also contribute uh, to the DC Environmental Film Festival. Uh, we'll see you on the front lines. <laughs>